Today we'll look at how predefined variables work for procedural textures in Affinity Photo. Now I should mention that this topic will cover some programming concepts and math, but I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. Also, if you haven't watched my first procedural textures video, I recommend checking that out first. I'll leave a link in the description below. Let's start with a simple procedural texture that makes an image black and white. I have this image of a landscape here. How can we make it black and white with a procedural texture? Well first, let's understand how the RGB channels work. I'll add a procedural texture to my layer here. So I'll click Live Filters, Procedural Texture. And now what I'm going to do is add my own equation. So I'll click this plus here, Add Equation. And now you can see we have a row that got added. By default, it created an equation of zero and it assigned it to our red channel. We also have green, blue, and alpha channels we can assign values to. So this formula is gonna look at every single pixel in our image and apply this formula to it. Now, if I take the color picker, and if I hover over every pixel in my image, you'll see that the red value is always zero. So it's zero in the landscape, zero in the sky. Red is always getting assigned that value of zero. I could do it for the green channel instead, so I'll disable red. I'll click green. Now if I hover over my pixels, the green value is always zero, no matter where I go. And we could select multiple channels if I wanted, so I could do red and green. Now only the blue channel is showing up because we assigned zero to red and green. So you saw how we could remove red from a channel. We can set it to zero, but what if we wanted to maximize the red value? Well, in RGB color, you may remember that the maximum value a channel can have is 255. However, that is not how color works with procedural textures. Procedural textures work on a range of zero to one. So if I want to maximize the red value in every pixel, I would assign it one. So let's put a one here. I'll hit enter. Now you can see my image looks very red, of course. Let's test it with the color picker. And now if I hover over every pixel, you'll see red is 255, even though we assigned it one. You can think of one as being 100%, and 100% maps to 255. So everything is maxed out red. If I want red to be half of the value, I could do 0 0.5. And now red is going to be 127. So let's look at that. And you can see red is 127 everywhere. So this is the important thing to remember about these channels. They work on a value range of zero to one. Now, what if we go above one? Well, let's try that. I'll put 17 in here. And you can see it just maxes out the red channel. The reds are all 255 again. So anything above one just gets mapped to one. Similarly, if we go below zero, let's do negative 45. It just maps to zero. So looking at the pixels, the red is always zero. Negative 45 or any negative value just gets set to zero. Let's put in something completely invalid. Let's do six divided by zero. Well, this is undefined and our equation is just completely ignored. The same thing happens if I just type in random letters. It's going to have no effect. So this is something to keep in mind as you're working with procedural textures. If you type in something that has invalid syntax, Affinity Photo will just ignore it. Now we can actually add multiple equations here, so I'll add another one. And let's assign one to green. And you can see nothing is happening. Because we have an invalid equation here, none of our equations are getting acted upon. But I can click this X to delete that first equation. And now green is being maxed out here. Now just assigning numbers to channels isn't that interesting. What if we want to actually access the red, green, and blue values that are in that pixel? Well, we actually have access to three variables that allow us to do that, R, G, and B. So here I'll type in R and I'll put it in the red channel. Now this isn't really doing anything different. It's just taking the red value and assigning it back to the red channel. But watch what happens if I divide by two. I'll say divide by two. You can see now my image is slightly more cyan because all the red values were cut in half. This texture looks at every single pixel value, finds the red value and divides it by two, then it assigns it back to the red channel. Now down here we have these custom inputs. Let me add one from zero to one. And by default, the first one you create gets called A. I can multiply my red channel by A times A. Now currently A is maxed out at one, but I can dial down A all the way to zero. So this has the effect of reducing our red value. Similarly, I could add another equation Let's say green times B. I'll add another slider here. It automatically gets defined as B. And now I can dial down the green value. I'll add another slider for C. And let's add another equation, blue times C. So here we've created a simple procedural texture that allows us to dial down each channel in our image. Now something that's really important to understand is that case matters in these equations. 
So R, G, and B have to be capitalized to represent the actual R, G, B values in the channel. And these A, B, and C values are lowercase down here. Notice how the capital B represents the blue channel here, and the lowercase b here represents our control. So you want to be very careful when you mix these things. Now we finally have the ability to make our image grayscale. Remember that a grayscale image has the same value assigned to every channel. So let's add a formula here. I'll select green and blue. Now what if I assign 0.5 to all our channels? Let's try that, 0.5. And my image is just gray here. What we want to do is use the RGB value of each pixel to calculate gray. Now there are many ways to convert color to grayscale. Remember that there are about 16 million colors in RGB color and only 256 levels of gray. So there's a lot of ways to throw out all that color data. Let's just start with a simple one. Let's take the average value of all the channels. So I'll take red plus green plus blue. I'll divide by three. And now you can see we have a grayscale image. So this works for our purposes. Now this formula is actually a little too simplistic and it has one critical flaw. If you look closely, you'll notice that pure red, green, and blue values will all look like the same thing in grayscale. So if I turn off our procedural texture, let me make a red square. Let's make a green square. Let's make a blue square. Let's put our procedural texture above them. And now if I turn on our procedural texture, you can see red, green, and blue look exactly the same. That's because our formula gave them all equal weight. Let's put in a better formula that more accurately simulates the lightness of those colors. Let's do 0.3 times red, 0.59 times green, and 0.11 times blue. I'll hit enter. And now you can see we have a better result. We're able to distinguish between the R, G, and B values. So in this section, we learned that we have access to the values R, G, and B. And we also created some custom variables earlier. Let's now look at the X and Y variables. The X and Y variables can give us the coordinates of our pixels. This can be one of the most valuable pieces of information when generating a procedural texture. Let's consider how we can make a gradient going from left to right like this. So I have this empty document here. Let's just give it a fill layer so we can work on it. I'll make it a slight blue, but the color doesn't really matter because we're not going to use that data. And let's give it a procedural texture. And the variable we want to work with is X. So as X increases from left to right, we want it to go from dark to white. So let's put X here. Let's go for all the channels. And it doesn't really have the effect we want. It made our whole image white. And the reason it did that is that our image is 1000 by 1000 pixels wide. So X is going from one to a thousand. And if you remember, our color range only goes from zero to one. So how can we get our output here to be between zero and one? Well, we can divide our X by the width of our document. And we can use another variable called W to do that. So I'll take X. I'll divide it by W and I'll hit enter. And now we have our gradient. X is going from zero on the left. And on the right, the X is reaching the width value. It's dividing it by the width and that equals one. Let's just zoom into our gradient and see what's happening here. This left pixel is black, zero, zero, zero. And let's look at the top right pixel. It's 254 across the board. Now this is off by one. Technically our pixel grid is starting at the top left at 0 0.5, 0 0.5. That's the top left pixel. It's not actually zero, zero or one, one, but for most cases, that's not really a problem that we have to worry about. Now we also have Y and H values. So Y is going up and down and H is the height. So let's do Y, H. And we have this linear gradient going up and down now. There's some other cool stuff we can do. We can just limit it to one channel. I'll do a gradient in the other channel. In this channel, I'll do X divided by W. And now you can see we have this cool nonlinear gradient. The final two variables I want to talk about are Rx and Ry. These are very similar to X and Y. However, they allow you to recenter the coordinate system so that you can control it with your mouse. Let me once again add the simple formula X divided by W. Now, if I click and drag my mouse, nothing happens. But instead of X, if I change it to Rx, now I can actually recenter where my pattern starts. In fact, this is more clear if we use some of the presets. So let me click preset here. I'll choose waves. And notice in this equation, there's R, Y, and R, X. I can click and drag around, and I can change the center of the pattern. Now, if I edit the formula to just use Y and X, watch what happens. I'll take out the R, just make it Y. Let's take out this R, X, just make it X. Now I can't click and drag anymore. So in most equations you see, they'll probably use R, X, and R, Y to give the user some more control. 
But when you're building an equation and trying to debug it, I think just using x and y by itself is a good way to go. And then later on, you can change it to rx and ry. So let's review the variables we looked at in this video. R, G, B, and A are for our channel values, red, green, blue, and alpha. Remember they're on a scale of 0 to 1, not 0 to 255. X and Y are the coordinates of your pixels. And using R, X, and R, Y instead will allow you to recenter the coordinate system with your mouse. And W and H are the width and height of your document. I'll be making more videos on procedural textures, so be sure to subscribe to my channel to get notified when they come out. And of course, if you have any questions on this video, feel free to leave a comment below. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next video.